Welcome to the Keto Edge Summit, where we are dispelling the myths, helping you overcome the hurdles, and empowering you to improve your brain and body through the ketogenic lifestyle. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers, and I've got a great guest today. This is Mike Mutzel, and he wrote a great book called The Belly Fat Effect that I read. It was really one of the best books I read back in 2015. I really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. And our topic today is keto and the microbiome. And Mike has a great podcast, High Intensity Health, and that's your website as well, High exactly. Intensity Health, yep. right? Master's degree in nutrition, mm -hmm. right? Wrote this awesome book. And also he does a lot of speaking on the ketogenic diet, how it impacts the microbiome. This is really where he's a specialist. And so we're gonna jump into this topic in detail. And so as we get started, Mike, just number one, really an honor to have you out here. Yeah, thanks um, for the opportunity. This yeah, is great. Yeah, definitely, this is great. And, and we both have a similar message, really helping people improve their diet, improve their microbiome, and really help facilitate this, this uh, process of ketosis. And so totally. tell the audience really how you got involved with this and, and your health journey. Yeah, so there's there's mm -hmm. multiple facets, you know, but it, it comes down like we were talking about earlier. You know, when I was young, I was really into, involved in action sports and mm -hmm. snowboarding, BMXing, you know, uh, rollerblading, skateboarding, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I can remember hitting my head many, many times, getting dizzy. At, you know, as four boys in the family, we were always boxing and fighting. So I always and I struggled in school for a very long time, and I, I've always and I still am uh, conscious of like head trauma, you know. And it was uh, a bodybuilding friend of mine, Greg back in 2000, uh, 2002, a year after college, or a year after high school, I was do doing a junior college before I got my four-year degree in biology, and he introduced me to, to this low-carb style diet. Yeah, and so that involved basically cutting out all the carbs, and I was eating oatmeal and kind of a bodybuilding yam, yeah. sweet potatoes, and so it was a lot of nut butters and things like that, avocado, and I noticed a lot of weight loss, um, and just you know getting real lean and things like that, but then all of a sudden I could focus in school in a way that I never had before. And I, so since that point, I'm not saying that I've been in ketosis at all since 2002, I didn't really know what the ketogenic diet meant or what it was. There was a few bodybuilders at our gym that were on it, but I've been you know, using this lower carbohydrate style diet for weight loss. And I realized that that's when my brain really turned on. I could focus, I could concentrate, I could really read and articulate you know, what I read and memorize things in a different way. So I realized there was a lot of mental benefits to this. And when I started getting into you know, my master's degree training and learning about biology and cell signaling and, and kind of this coalescence between nutrition and really physiological function, I realized that these ketones do much more than you know just offer uh, an alternative fuel source. They're mm -hmm. secondary signaling molecules and, yeah. and they affect inflammatory switches. They affect, as you talk a lot about, brain-derived neurotrophic yes. factor. So that was like this aha moment, realizing that this way of eating, it's not just another diet. A lot of people are, are confused that, oh, keto, it's just Atkins all over again. And it's, it's really not because right. these ketones are in in and of themselves powerful signaling molecules. Yeah. So then when I got into that, I was, I'd been hooked and that's been about th a three year journey. And I've been wanting to interview all these different people to help, you know, for my own knowledge, but spread that knowledge to other, yeah. other folks. Because if you ask a random uh, Sally Smith off the street, or if you're sitting in an airplane, which I unfortunately do a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and were to ask someone, hey, have you heard of the ketogenic mm -hmm. diet? They're invariably gonna say, oh yeah, that high fat, low carb diet. That's just like the Atkins and it's totally yeah. not. So I wanna dispel that myth and let people know that you know, when you're in a state of ketosis, and it doesn't always have to be, in my estimation, I would love your feedback here, doesn't always have to be diet induced. Yeah. You can fast induced. Totally. You can exercise induce your way into a ketogenic diet. There are so many people that are uh, metabolically flexible athletes, yes. and they, they're moderately, they eat a moderate carb or even high carb diet, yet they are in ketosis because one way to get our liver to make more ketones is just to exercise. So it, it's synergistic with all the healthy lifestyle factors that a lot of the functional integrative medicine doctors that are reputable in our space are talking about. You know, yeah. So compressing that feeding window, periodically fasting, which stresses the system yes. in a positive way, right. eating more real whole foods, mm -hmm. being mindful, chewing your foods, because digestion is so key for absorbing these fats and breaking them down. So I realized that this is a very, very healthy lifestyle. And so that's one of the messages yeah. that I love to preach. It's not just about swapping my, one macro for another. It's a, a sweeping lifestyle change that imagine having more mental clarity, more energy, yeah. more even energy, a better, deeper sleep, less right. inflammation. Uh, that has such a huge carryover in your huge. life. Yeah. So that's, that's why I'm sold. Yeah. I mean, and that's really why we're doing this summit is we want to help people improve their metabolic flexibility and energy efficiency. And those are kind of big terms. Like you and I get that because sure. we're, we're kind of health nerds. 
But it's like, just like you said, I mean, that means better sleep at night, more energy throughout the day, better emotional stability. And that's a huge thing. When our blood sugar is all out of whack and what we're going to talk about, our microbiome is all out of whack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> our level of aggressiveness, our, <clears throat> excuse me, our, our mood, um, our emotional stability, all that stuff go, just gets tanked. You know? yeah. and, and so, I mean, we can just literally change humanity by encouraging these sorts of principles. And so I know you wrote this book years ago. Mm -hmm. Did you write this in 2014 or 15? Yeah, so it published early yes. 2014, actually early you know, 2014. wrote it in 2013. Exactly, yeah. and the microbiome, and it still is such a huge topic of yeah. studies and conversation in the health world. And this is literally, I mean, the best book that I read that Thank for you. a doctor who's practicing in how to apply a lot of the principles and use a lot of scientific terms, but also at the same time just broken down for a lay person who's interested in learning more yeah. um, that, that somebody could read back in, you know, back in 2015 when I read it. Yeah. Now, you really didn't go into the ketogenic diet back then. This is before your, your, your days getting into the keto, ketogenic diet, yeah. but you're obviously a specialist in the microbiome. So share with our audience really how, what you've learned as far as how the ketogenic diet affects the microbiome. Yeah, that's a <clears> wonderful <throat> point. Well, and, and one reason why I didn't mention the ketogenic yeah. diet at, virtually at all in that book was I was myopically focused on the microbiome. Uh, right. And basically, long story short, when I was working with a physician in Denver, Colorado, uh, I wanted to go to medical school. So I was doing an internship, working as a nutritionist, and kind of you know doing rotations and things. And one of the medical assistants at that clinic, she was morbidly obese. She got bariatric surgery, and this was in 2008. And so, rap I mean, literally within weeks, like every time I saw her, her body kept shrinking, and I thought. Mm -hmm. That's so, how can this possibly work? Because, it, you know, what's the mechanism of action? You know, I, I love the biology and the biomechanics mm. and all that. So went to the research and it turns out that bariatric surgery, the way that it really causes weight loss is by affecting the microbiome, the, the composition of the microbiome, reducing bacterial endotoxin, which we'll define and yeah. talk about, and then increasing these gut hormones. So, I, you know, so many people, again, just like they think the ketogenic diet is just Atkins revisited, a lot of people think that bariatric surgery is just restricting how much food people can eat. And that's like a very small percentage of the actual mechanism. Right. So I just went head first for years into this microbiome mm. research, you know, started interviewing and calling experts on this to, to figure out, you know, if my interpretation of the research was on par. And so that's, you know, that was pre-microbiome project and everything. So. You know, long story short, every single time we eat or think about food, um, you know, we're affecting these gut hormones. And these gut hormones are higher up, kind of up, up, upstream of insulin signaling. So we think that we eat carbohydrates, our blood sugar rises, insulin has a compensatory rise to put that blood sugar into places. Yeah. But it turns out that these gut hormones regulate the release of insulin mm -hmm. and how insulin sensitivity works and all that. So right. all of our dietary macronutrients from carbohydrates, fats, proteins, influence the increase or decrease of these gut hormones. And it turns out that fats really have a powerful effect on these gut hormones. Yeah. And uh, you know, we talk about how the ketogenic diet affects the parasympathetic tone and so forth. One of the mechanisms is through the gut, through the gut mm -hmm. hormones. And so we know that one of these hormones, cholecystokine and CCK, it's involved in you know, contracting the gallbladder, yeah. but it also affects parasympathetic tone. So it's kind of this, this gut to brain, this bi-directional feedback system between our brain and our gut. So that's really, really exciting. But anyway, what I was trying to get at is one reason why I didn't really talk about the keto diet at that point is a lot of the, the human studies that I was reading were focused on metabolic endotoxemia. And so one you know, way, so basically we all have five grams of this gram negative bacteria in our GI tract. Bacteria, you know, for example, E. coli would be yeah. one gram negative bacteria. Mm -hmm. Uh, bacteria have different, you know, cell structures and different cell wall components. Gram-negative bacteria have this little appendage called lipopolysaccharide. It turns out that, you know, if you have a lot of liquid fat, so to differentiate healthy fats from like liquid processed type fats, fried foods, for example, uh, a lot of liquid butter, you know, or a lot of liquid pork fat um, that would be found in a, in a traditional kind of a, a unhealthy Western style diet, just overdoing the fats and things like that, that can cause these formation of chylomicrons in absorbing these gram negative bacterial fragments called endotoxin that is very pro-inflammatory. So that can cause this whole metabolic shift, you know, to favor kind of glycolytic metabolism. Everything that we're, we're trying to do in the ketogenic diet and foster fatty acid breakdown can be reversed from this endotoxin. 
So that's why I was like, you know what? I don't know. You know, everyone was putting, this was like pre-bulletproof coffee in it. And then yeah. that was taken off. And I'm like, you know, I don't know that that's the best idea because mm-hmm. I was reading these studies where they were having liquid butter in someone's diet. They would measure right. their blood levels. And then an hour later, there would be high levels of these gram negative bacteria causing inflammation. So I was like, you know what? I think it's better to, you know, reinforce and help people understand that they need to have a diverse array of phytonutrients, yeah. diverse array of fiber. Um, you know, moderate protein, you know, not processed carbs in any way, but mm-hmm. real whole, you know, carbohydrates, because that will improve the diversity and the stability of the microbiome and kind of decrease how much of this endotoxin can come across. Yeah. So that was kind of the message, you know, uh, in, in that book. So that's one of the ways, you know, to, to recap, how can the ketogenic diet kind of affect the yes. microbiome? Um, some studies have shown that it increases Acromenzia mucinophilia. Hmm. This is a bacteria genus and species that's associated with reducing inflammation within the gut. Uh, exercise also increases acromenzia. High fiber does, but our research out of John Rose lab, he's at University of Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary, has shown that the ketogenic diet increases this healthy bacteria, which right. is great. Um, hmm. So, so that's one attribute. And then we we talked about the gut hormones, particularly yep. CCK cholecystokinin. Mm-hmm. So. Um, having healthy fats, avocado, coconut, nuts, and seeds. I love olives. I'm yeah. sure you do as well. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. um, for their polyphenols. Yes. Yep. Can be absolutely wonderful. And so I, I don't want to scare people that, because, it, you know, if you do get into the metabolic endotoxemia research, you might at first be kind of scared of, of fat. Like, like I was kind of starting to re-question things, but it's really uh, liquid fat, processed fat, fried mm. fat foods uh, with devoid of phytonutrients. Yeah. So, for example, one clinical study that you know, I remember very well reading and being kind of blown away by was these, these individuals were uh, recommended to take a, a 900 calorie shake. It was like a McDonald's milkshake, okay? Really high in liquid fat and cream. And then that was like arm A. Arm B of the group had that same shake with just a, a quarter cup of orange juice, which has polyphenols. Just adding just that, it wasn't like organic cold press orange juice. It was just probably just junk, yeah, sunny, concentrated, concentrated yeah. stuff you can get at a store. But even that in and of itself reduced the absorption of the endotoxin. Yes. So I just love reminding people when they're embarking on this way of eating, make sure that you're having, don't be scared of these fruits, vegetables that have a lot of lower in carbohydrates, high in polyphenols and fiber, because that can really enhance the microbiome and prevent this endotoxemia. Yeah, so what you're saying is, hey, when you're having your fat, make sure you've got vegetables with it. Basically, yeah. vegetables and fat, that combination is going to help reduce this endotoxemia that, that you're talking about. Totally. And yeah. if you're cooking, you know, I think we have similar philosophies when it comes to yeah. animal protein. People totally overdo the animal protein, oh, yeah. in my estimation, yeah. uh, especially when they go keto. So I think it's very yeah. important, like, like I'm with you, and maybe even sometimes I eat less, I eat way less animal protein, especially yeah. now because I have chickens, which we can talk more about. <laughs> uh, that influenced my decision making like you know um how could we protect our animals like because we had a raccoon attack like we have like 17 chickens and a raccoon came and attacked our chickens and i realized like hunter gatherer people how they couldn't eat all this animal protein because there's so many predators so anyway long story short but if you're cooking a lot of pork uh, lamb you know beef grass-fed great sources Mm -hmm. if you're doing that make sure that you're using rosemary tarragon yeah. curcumin right. um, all these polyphenols in the cooking process that will yeah. reduce advanced glycation end products Big but yeah. also endotoxin from the animal fat so that's the key thing we're not just trashing you know animal protein at all right. but just cook it like our ancestors would probably cook it and don't just throw a bunch of butter in a pan and let it saute and fry and call it good yeah. you need to kind of overemphasize, you know, the tarragon, rosemary, garlic, yes. ginger. Yes, yeah, and absolutely. I think that's that's a big thing because there's a community of people that really demonize animal protein, okay? Yeah. And there's a community of people that think, hey, we need to be on this high protein diet, eating protein every several hours. And so kind of the in-between is, hey, let's take the highest quality source of the animal protein, which is going to be your grass-fed, pasture-raised animal products, and then let's combine it with these phytonutrient-rich herbs, vegetables, things like that, in order to reduce, you know, whenever we're cooking meat, most people aren't eating it raw, though, you know, you certainly could. If we're cooking meat, we're going to damage those amino acids. We're going to create heterocyclic amines, Mm -hmm. all these different, you know, advanced glycolytic enzymes. And, uh, And so when we're doing that, we add in the phytonutrients, now we start to create an antioxidant reserve that helps protect against it. So exactly. that's basically what we're doing. And really it tastes great, because you've got like totally. lemon pepper chicken. Yeah. I mean, come on, that tastes amazing. So yeah. it actually enhances the flavor of it and allows you obviously to digest it better. And I'm always a huge fan of too of 
taking like lemon juice or apple cider vinegar, right? Some sort of a vinegar or acid and putting that on meat as well. So yes. you start the digestive process Brilliant. before it even gets into your body. What are your thoughts on that? I love that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's <clears> so key. And especially, I mean, we talked about, you know, when we did our interview a couple yes. years ago that even having that in the pre-meal state, because so many yes. people were, were stressed out, were very busy and we're trying to eat healthier, but maybe our, our physiology is not primed to digest that healthy food. So I think yeah. that's just, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, a deep breaths, a nasal breathing beforehand, breathing through your left nostril can really yeah. enhance parasympathetic tone. So yes. yeah, there's, again, so it reinforces, you know, the eating low carb, high fat, mm -hmm. like reinforces everything that we're, we're trying to get across yeah. here. Let's talk about that term parasympathetic tone, right? Sure. In, in this, in this summit, we've talked about fight or flight versus rest and heal this sympathetic fight or flight mode versus parasympathetic rest and rebuild. And so we want to promote that parasympathetic tone and just tell our audience a little bit more about what that is and ways that they can, they can do that. <laughs> yeah. So this vagal nerve innervates, yes. you know, uh, it's, it's part of, uh, I don't know the whole neurology all, all that yeah. well, but the vagus know. is Latin for wanderer and it's nice. the longest nerve in the body, right? So it literally goes from our brainstem. I mean, all the way down through the bottom of our digestive tract. Brilliant. So yeah. I did not know that wander. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good to know. Um, yeah. So, so just chewing, being mindful, uh, nasal left nostril breathing can really enhance the tone of this vagal mm. nerve. Uh, and, and also, you know, so that's kind of the, the top down kind of the bottom up, you know, eating fats and stimulating cholecystokinin from the GI tract can also innervate it, innervate this nerve as well. So, you know, it's critical for turning on digestion, for turning on motility, making sure that we're digesting things north to south, which yeah. is what we want to be doing, and uh, particularly enhancing bile flow. I know you're a big fan right. of bile, liver health, gallbladder yes. health. Um, and we're learning so much more about bile's antimicrobial properties mm. within the GI tract. Yep. And so people are even using bile for SIBO now, yeah. you know, bile acid. Yeah. So I think that's one under-discovered and under-recognized aspect of the ketogenic diet. Because if you're having a lot of processed carbohydrates, obviously you're going to feed the bad bugs, but you're also not going to be releasing bile that has an antimicrobial property. Big. So bile also neutralizes endotoxin bacteria as well, meaning so that if there's bile acids, they can sequester that gram-negative pro-inflammatory fragment so that if you're having a higher fat diet, you know, that that can be helped to neutralize. But yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, in improved parasympathetic tone, improved bile release, good motility, good yeah. gut hormones. Um, and it turns out that bile acids are found throughout the body. You know, it's yeah. really funny. They're finding bile acids in the heart, in the really? brain. So, so, you know, we're relearning everything hmm. about the gut, how it affects systemic health. So I think it's, it's important. And then of course, how do we release bile or what causes the bile to be released? Healthy fat foods. So yes. avocado, coconut, <clears throat> olives, nuts, and seeds. Yeah, because bile with the fat will emulsify the fat. So we've always known that that's what bile does. A bile salt, kind of like soap on a pan. If you just, you know, take water, you know, neutral water, cold water on a pan with oil, it's not gonna get the oil off. You need some sort of a soap with salts. And so bile does that with fats. So when we eat fat, our body produces the bile in order to emulsify it so we can digest it well. So we already knew that. Okay, and that's what most people understand bile as. What you're saying is now we're realizing that bile actually has an antimicrobial effect, meaning that we've got all this bacteria in our gut microbiome, and it helps basically to kill off a lot of those, which is important because we, we kind of have to continually cycle through these bacteria, and it's like pruning the hedges. Exactly. You know what I mean? And uh, like mowing our lawn in a sense, right? Or else we just get overgrown weeds and then we end up with a lot of health issues. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're, we're really rethinking the mechanisms of all these different things that we've known to be healthy. And, and, yeah. and you know, from chiropractic medicine, you know, yeah. early dentistry and, and naturopathic medicine have talked about, you know, the importance of digestion and being in a good, healthy state. Now we're re relearning the mechanisms, which is so awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's just, uh, it's amazing to be a part of this and really being on the, and being able to access literature so easily today, right? right? We're able to look at this and kind of make sense of it all. It's just awesome. Totally. And so we're talking about parasympathetic term. You had mentioned yeah. left nostril breathing. Yeah. Right? I find that fascinating. Yeah. And so th this may sound a little woo-woo yeah. uh, for a lot of people and it, and it did for me. Um, but when I learned meditation, mm -hmm. I found that, you know, um, I, you know, sometimes if I didn't do nostril breathing beforehand, I never got into that deep Zen state. Mm. And so I started playing around with it. And so this would be just like spending one or two minutes just breathing through the left nostril. Um, 
and, and again, it, I don't know the neural tracks and all that, but somehow it does affect, and this could be anecdotally, yeah. um, but there is some evidence from what I, I gather from naturopathic colleagues of mine. And so just doing that, even when I was driving over here, I was like, oh man, am I gonna be late and all this stuff? I'm just gonna chill out. Oh. There was some uh, construction down the road. Yeah. And it really just helped you know, get through this traffic and these stoplights. And the, so what a great hack when we're in the car, exactly. we're stressed in traffic, you just cover your right nostril and just... Exactly, yeah. yeah, and then so you can, that gets kind of boring, just, well, yeah. first of all, it's good for a, a, a myriad of different factors we can talk about. You know, a lot of people just can't breathe through their nose. Yeah, And right. so I know you talked about this on a YouTube video, yeah. you know, mouth taping. mouth taping. Which I learned from you and, yeah. and watching your videos, yep. Now I learned from Dr. Mark Brehenna, so thanks, Mark, for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a, another game changer in yeah. my life. You know, for, for my whole life, I was just breathing through yes. my mouth, you know, when I was breathing and I, I would wake up kind of fatigued and tired. I remember, again, in high school, like I could barely make it through the day and, and had no recollection of what we talked about because it was just in this days because I didn't get good deep restorative sleep so that was like a major game changer yeah. so you know and I have friends that tell me oh I can never mouth tape because my nose yeah. is clogged yeah. up I'm yeah, like yeah. that's a symptom like you need to address that <laughs> not just ignore that you know exactly so being able to to alternate your nostrils and breathe through those for at least three minutes spend six breaths per minute so if you can slow your breathing process down so your inhale is maybe like 15, 20 seconds, pause, exhale for another 15 or 20. That can really, just doing that for like you, you it's like. It's a huge difference. Yeah. And it's free. You don't need to, you don't need to go to a doctor. You don't need to exactly. buy a bunch of supplements. It's something you can do anytime you're feeling stressed. And then the carryover, improved gut health, motility, digestion, all that stuff. So it's key. I love it. And so where he was talking about mouth taping, and this is a great thing. I mean, for the ketogenic community and anybody that's listening to this, this is what I found was that I, I never thought I snored, okay? And then I got married and my wife said, you know, you're making noise. And she's a light sleeper as it is, you're making noise at night. And so I started looking into things as far as why would I snore? Or why would I be breathing deep or loud, making noise when I'm breathing? And I came across your video talking about mouth taping. So I was like, this makes sense. So if I cover my mouth, Mouth breathing in general is associated with the fight or flight response, so sympathetic nervous system. So mm -hmm. stress hormones are gonna be activated. That's not gonna allow me to get the best sleep either. Right. So if I put the tape over my mouth, now that's gonna help dampen that sympathetic response, activate more of that parasympathetic nervous system, which is good for my gut, also really good for just tissue repair, healing, and deep sleep. And now I'm gonna be able to sleep deeper at night. And I noticed, I mean, the first day, Obviously it was weird just mm -hmm. because you're not used to having tape on your mouth, but I noticed immediately that, that in general I slept deeper. My blood sugar was lower when I'd wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you see that too. I see mm -hmm. that with a lot of my clients who are trying to get into ketosis. They have the dawn effect with this high elevated blood sugar due to typically high cortisol in the morning. Mm -hmm. So my cortisol was a little bit lower, more balanced. We're supposed to have higher cortisol in the morning. So I was more relaxed there. Ketones higher in the morning. And just in general, that was a sign of better parasympathetic, you know, it's parasympathetic dominance and parasympathetic tone there. Yeah, yeah. that's so, so key. it's powerful. Yep. Yeah, it's, and it's a really under-recognized aspect. Yes. You know, people, we've been so, we've been told kind of like, you need to have a certain number of calories per day. You right. just need to have a certain number of hours mm -hmm. per sleep. And we don't really talk about the sleep quality. Yeah. You know, and, and again, it, it, I think the details, that's why these summits and interviews are great because yeah. we can talk about the details of a healthy ketogenic diet, healthy sleep quality. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that you're not on your cell phone in your bedroom, have the TV going in the bedroom and all that. So really, I would say, you know, the keto thing has been huge for my personal health, but improving sleep quality. Yeah. And I write in my journal, like one of the things that I repeat to myself every day is treating sleep as though it's my job. Because it is That's your good. job. Like, like if that. you don't get good sleep, your job's going to suck. Yeah. Your ability to parent is going to suck mm. because little things are going to irritate you or make you upset. Food sensitivities, food cravings, I mean, exercise yeah. recovery, every, it has so much carryover. Yeah. And so sleep quality is key. Yeah, gigantic, so yeah. huge. So um, we're talking about keto and the microbiome, but I mean, sleep quality really does have a big impact on our microbiome, blood sugar, ketosis, all that kind of stuff. So it's a totally. great addition to this. And uh, so with going back to keto and the microbiome, yeah. what are some of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing people make when they're on a ketogenic diet 
when it comes to really taking care of their microbiome in their gut. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that I've learned through, through doing a lot of online coaching mm -hmm. and things like that is, is people feel that they need to have a lot more fat than they really need. Yeah. You know, most people are going into the ketogenic diet because they want to lose weight. Yeah. So they, by definition, they have extra, you know, stores of fat on their body. So, so I think a better strategy is, is instead of like trying to aim for 150 or 200 grams of fat per day because mm -hmm. their body weight, yeah. You know, really focus on compressing that feeding window. Yeah. You know, and you highlighted that study, you know, in animals in 2014 yes. that showed that, you know, intermittent fasting can really improve the yeah. microbiome, yeah. but it also really lends well to ketosis. Yeah. And so th that's the thing that I love to recommend to people. Um, other parts, a lot of people kind of neglect exercise. You know, they think, okay, well, because there's you know gurus in our space that say you only need to exercise once a week and then you're good and yeah. I really disagree with that mm -hmm. I think we need to at least get 15 20,000 steps per day get a Fitbit yeah. get an aura ring track your movement mm -hmm. and then you know embark on resistance training is really yes. key for hormones mm -hmm. It also resistance training and exercise, particularly you know, um, burst type training intervals, right. improves gut bacterial diversity, improves mm. gut health, yep. which lends to this whole you know, down regulation of inflammation. Yeah. Uh, but it enhances ketogenesis. So the formation right. of ketones, aka ketogenesis, um, you know, we get through that. You know, the signals that trigger hepatic ketogenesis are low blood sugar, low insulin, and so we can drop our blood sugar and insulin by exercising, not Very necessarily true. driving a bunch of fat into our yeah. into our system when we have a lot of stored fat. So that's the thing to, to kind of summarize. Instead of overdoing the fat in your diet, mm -hmm. try to trigger your body to start burning fat more efficiently. And again, I'm not anti-fat in the diet at all. I think healthy fats are great, but I do find a lot of people um, they start aiming, oh, I need to get hit my macros today. So I need to have 100. <clears throat> it's like, well, listen to your body and your gut right. more. Like, were you exercising today? Were you inactive? Were you sitting all day? You probably don't need as much as you really think. Exactly. Um, so that's, you know, it, and it comes back to this whole mind-body connection that I, I think it's really, people are very left brain. They want to know the numbers, the steps, the processes. Yeah. But we need to just think back. So some days I might have only 50 grams of fat because I'm, yeah. I'm not that hungry. Other days it's 220 because I'm really active. So I think True. having that ability to um, listen to your body and then customize the plan for your activity level and goal. Is key. I like that. I like that. And it really, we were talking about this before, it's really ancestral approach. So like our ancestors, they weren't in ketosis because they were trying to, you know, count their macros, you yeah. know, and, and load up on coconut oil and stuff like that. It was just the way, it was just the way of life, right? And they were very active people. They also had times of feasting and times of famine where food wasn't available and it just naturally put them into ketosis. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're really mirroring what unindustrialized people are doing throughout the world. Very and so I think that that's key. And so, you know, so many people, and I think that's a natural progression to just mm -hmm. improve metabolic flexibility. Yeah. It's just to start compressing that feeding window or going with a day without food periodically yeah. one day a week, you know, um, I don't think I've found it personally a little challenging and it's kind of socially restrictive to do intermittent fasting on the weekends. So I think during the week when you're yeah. busy, you're driving to work, you got meetings and stuff like that, or you're juggling kids, it's yes. really easy to just say, you know what, today, I'm just gonna have a little MCT oil in my coffee and mm -hmm. just call it good for the rest of the day. Maybe yeah. have dinner with my family or, or whatever works with your schedule. But trying to do it on the weekend when you got barbecues and family yeah. gatherings in church, it can <clears> become, you become the weird person, right. you know, like, oh, you're on this diet thing and it gets awkward. So just experiment during the week when you're really busy exactly. and, and you'll realize like, wow, this, I have so much more even energy. I'm not yeah, even hungry. That's amazing. Absolutely. So. And yeah, so you've you got to make it work for you. So you try to kind of figure out, and I'll tell, typically tell people to actually fast through breakfast because for most people, breakfast isn't a big social event. Right. Okay. If it, for some reason it is for you and dinner's not, then fast through dinner. Okay, but you want to find just a, a way and a strategy that works best for you. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really key. Yeah, definitely. Now, when we're on a ketogenic diet, one of the biggest issues that I see people have is constipation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're talking about the microbiome. Obviously, it plays a huge role in bowel motility. So, what are some things people can do to help improve their bowel motility? Um, you know, as they're on a ketogenic diet. Yeah, this and this took me a long time to kind of master yeah. in my own personal life, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't realize like at first what was going on with that. And we were talking about this offline, but increasing your salt intake. 
Yeah. And you know, just a not, you know, this is another thing where we can get it from a supplement like real table salt, which is great, or we can get it through real food, like fermented foods. Yeah. And so if we think about, you know, if we take a step back, look at the big picture, look at the forest, not necessarily the trees, we realize that most people probably were keto during kind of the winter months when they were eating fermented foods and that a random or when they caught an animal of sorts, mm -hmm. you know, which would, would come in waves and pulses. So I think naturally during that time, we would have more salt intake when we're yeah. kind of keto. So I think it makes sense, you know, for people to, obviously if they're traveling and they can't bring, you know, kimchi on an airplane, mm -hmm. okay, bring your, you know, Redmond yeah. Real table salt. But uh, having salt and then drinking a lot of water. I notice yeah. that, you know, when I'm keto, I just drink a ton of water. Yes. You know? And so when I travel, I try and get glass bottles, you know, yeah. or bring a water, it sounds really nerdy, but uh, bring a water filter in my suitcase okay. so that yeah. that works in hotel yeah, rooms, a little yeah, yeah. Berkey, they make a smaller oh, yeah. one. Really good idea. Because otherwise you're drinking plastic and you don't know if it's yes. been heated or the phthalates and all that. So that's really essential. Fermented foods, increasing your salt intake. I know some people, they start their day with like five grams of salt, yeah. real table salt mm -hmm. with filtered water and just get it down just to make sure oh, yeah. they're kind of covering their salt bases. I was um, catching up with Dr. Stephen Finney, mm -hmm. who wrote, uh, co-wrote The Art and Science of Low-Carb Diets yep. for Athletes. Um, you know, he's a big, he's been big into salt for a very long time. He's, as many of our watchers probably know, has been studying the ketogenic diet in athletes since 1970s. And so this was one of the things that he found can be really key. And he kind of talked about the mechanisms, you know, low insulin affects salt um, excretion, but also prostaglandin E2, I didn't know about this. Uh, he let me know about that. That, that. that affects salt release within the cell as well. Wow, interesting. So there's, you know, kind of this fatty acid link there. Yeah. But Suffice it to say, increase water, increase real salt is, is key if you want to go low carb. Yeah, and salt's really key for keeping that blood sugar stable as well. Because if you don't have enough salt, you're going to increase your stress hormones, which are then going to increase your blood sugar and your insulin. Right. So you've got to get it. And you're going to start to crave it. And oftentimes people have sugar cravings. It's really that they're craving the salts and the minerals. So right. that's what I find. I know for myself, I crave it all the time. So like in the mornings, I'll do, you know, I'll do like a diluted broth for example, a vegetable broth or bone broth, which is very salt rich with water mm. and just truly really trying to super hydrate my body and get those electrolytes in. And I find that a warm drink is one of the best things. And I'm somebody who struggled with irritable bowel and I would have a lot of struggles with constipation years ago. And so I find that the warm drink itself with the salts seems to really help me get going. Mm, I nice. find that that really helps. And then also, you know, doing a lot of fermented foods, kim like, like kimchi, um, I love the mild kimchi, the spicy I can't mm. handle, but yeah. the mild is really good. Pickle brine, mm. I'll crave pickle brine. Interesting. And so, yeah, just I'll want to actually drink the pickle brine itself. Yeah. When, you know, back when I was on a higher carb diet, I never had a desire for pickle right. brine. So, Me neither. Yeah. So the kind of these natural salt-like cravings start to come about. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's key. And, and especially, you know, if we talk about the other lifestyle factors that we yeah. want people to embark on, like infrared sauna or high heat sauna, yes. which is great for oh, resiliency, so you're, you're leaching out a lot of minerals, a lot of yeah. salt. So yeah. that was another thing that I realized too, that like if I'm doing this, I need to really upregulate my yeah. mineral and salt. Sauna, exercise, I mean, anything that's, that you're going to basically increase your body temperature, you're going to sweat more, yeah. you're lose more of those minerals for sure. Yeah. So what are some other strategies other than just salt intake for helping improve bowel motility? Yeah, uh, magnesium at night. So yeah. we often talk about you know magnesium, like magnesium glycinate for mm -hmm. absorption and, and all that. But um, if someone is struggling, like if you're, you're new to this, you're jumping on, I would recommend getting magnesium citrate. It's very mm -hmm. poorly absorbed. It's really great for inducing yeah. a bowel movement. It's not gonna be one of these things where it's, you, you have tenismus and you're just sitting there and all of a sudden you have to go and you, yeah. you within 30 <laughs> seconds, it's more like it's gonna, like you said, you know, facilitate a natural bowel movement yeah. in the morning. Right. So I do travel with that because, mm -hmm. you know, water intake is variable. I don't drink True. water out of plastic. Yep. So some days I'm dehydrated, can rely upon a supplement in that context. Yeah. Yeah. So that can be key. Uh, just breathing exercises first thing in the morning. Mm. So this is, uh, you know, something that Wim Hof and, and Tony Robbins, people have a routine every morning. So I've been doing a lot of deep belly breathing for the last couple mm. years, first thing in the morning. And that can really help to, you know, I think we can talk about gut health from all the you know foods and everything else, yeah. but there's this kind of research emerging about these GI adhesions. And so when we're constantly sitting like this, our gut, there's just wow. tons of intestines going yeah. all these different directions and they can adhere to one another and create these adhesions and that can cause intestinal blockage, yeah. constipation. So I love, you know, doing morning twists and kind of, you know, this is like a, a, a kind of a yogic breathing, inhaling on this side 
exhaling on the right. So just twisting in the morning and that can enhance blood flow to the gut. Yeah. For a lot of us, if we have a lot of visceral fat here, it's, it's relatively hypoxic. Yeah. And you know, we can talk about sugar being a trigger for inflammation. Hypoxia is a huge trigger for inflammation. Yeah. So just moving more, breathing can be really key first thing in the morning. Um, so just doing a set of vinyasa yoga poses, mm -hmm. upward dog, downward dog, some twists, um, even you know planks in the morning. So I really enjoy that. Yeah. Um, if we're getting the bowel, so it's not, st I feel like it could be mm. stuck, you know? And so Absolutely. even massage, this is like old school. Especially like that ileocecal valve area yeah. can be real sensitive. Yeah. So yeah, those are some th easy strategies. So mm -hmm. some of this, you know, it sounds like there's a, we're talking about a lot of different things. And I just recommend people kind of write down and, and get into a routine. So every morning when they get up, it's not scrolling through social media, turning on the news. Right. It's like, all right, I do my breathing, I do my cold shower, I do my minerals, you know? And so it yes. becomes a habit. Right. And then you don't have to think about, okay, what should I do next? Uh, the guru said do this. It's like, no, no, just make it a habit. So. Yeah, create a ritual for yourself. I think yeah. that's huge. I know, especially if you're out there, you're dealing with constipation, the colon is most active in the morning. And so for me, it's more important to me to, to go to bed early, get up early, and actually have a really good ritual. So I'm, I'm moving my bowels at least once, once or twice in the morning before I really engage in anything else. I just find that my productivity is so much better. If you get into a, into a busy day and you haven't moved your bowels, the chances of you moving your bowels later in the day goes down significantly. Yeah. And then you've got more endotoxemia taking place, more putrefaction that, that takes place. I mean, if, they, if that food stuff is sitting in there, you're just going to get massive fermentation release of a lot of toxic chemicals and it's gonna to totally mess up your microbiome and your blood sugar and your ability to be in ketosis. Totally, and your hormones too. Yes. I, you know, a lot of women are struggling with hormone imbalances and yep. so our liver can do a great job of metabolizing these estrogens that we're exposed to in our environment and that we make, yeah. dumps them into the bi into, via the bile and, and so forth into the, into the GI tract and then if we're not defecating, they just right. get recirculated. It's called enterohepatic right. recirculation. It's yeah. well known um, and it's a problem too in the drug world, you know, when uh, pharmaceutical companies were looking at how drugs are excreted and they realized that these drugs can literally recirculate. So bowel movement, like you're saying, first thing in the morning, really essential. So important. Yeah. And you think about that too, because you were talking about hormones. I was thinking thyroid as well. So like if you're not moving your bowels well, now that's going to put more stress on your liver. Your liver plays a huge role in converting inactive thyroid hormone into active thyroid hormone that has expression in the cell. And so basically what's gonna happen now is you're not gonna be able to convert well, which is basically your body's not gonna express thyroid hormone well. And now that's gonna slow down bowel motility even more. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna go in, your hair's gonna be falling out, you're gonna have trouble with weight and all this kind of stuff. And really, it may have just come down to not having a good ritual in the morning to get your bowels going, and it became a vicious cycle out of outside of that. Yeah, you know, it's key that you yeah. mentioned liver health. I think that's yes. an important context to address with you know this whole keto thing because yeah. where are ketones made mostly is you know in the in liver, the liver. Yep. right and so a lot of people are, are go on the ketogenic diet because they're overweight or because they have diabetes but they can also have fatty liver non-alcoholic yeah. steatohepatitis and so they can have damaged liver and so that's the, again going back to this intermittent fasting compressing that feeding window can really help to metabolize that liver fat Huge. and exercise and so we we hear people say you know i went on a keto diet now like by, you know, fainted, I felt lightheaded. So their blood sugar dropped, but their liver hadn't yet started to make those ketones because it's filled with fat from the non-alcoholic fatty liver. Mm. So getting the body to become more flexible through other strategies, exercise, intermittent fasting, milk thistle, there's herbs too, yes, you know, omega-3 yeah. fats yeah. that can help. Mm -hmm. But that's another, you know, when we talked about the gut and related you know, organs like the liver, huge aspect when people are first curious about this, address that first because I think it can make a big yeah, difference. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's huge. And that's really also where that fasting, where you're doing the fasting window, super hydrate during that window. Because that hydration, just getting all the water in there will help move your bowels. It will help obviously sweep out a lot of toxins. I always tell my clients, they got to pee their way to good health, right? <laughs> That's awesome. And we yeah. could say you got to pee and poop your way yeah. to good health. And we got to remove these toxins from our system and get everything moving, you know, like a river, right? A river is a healthier waterbed than a pond. A mm. pond is going to have a lot of stagnicity. It's going to have a lot of um, algae growth and bacterial overgrowth and whatnot. And that's what, what brings about a bad smell. It can, um, you know, if we're swimming in ponds that don't have some sort of like active water moving into it, there's a higher chance of contamination and getting an infection as opposed to a river that's moving. And that's really what we want to do in our body is create that, that sort of a river. So, yeah. 
That's, yep. that's really key. Speaking yep. of that, you know, one tactic that may, may not yeah. be applicable for everyone is coffee enemas. Yeah. So I've yeah. been kind of quiet about this, but um, yeah. I do these regularly, do and you, yeah. I think they, they really can help. Um, my wife's not a fan. She, it's just, I mean, it's, it takes a lot of time. You got to like yeah. boil the water, get the coffee going for 20 minutes yep. and all this, but uh, it can be a really good uh, game yep. changer. And who inspired me on this, uh, Dr. Robin Chutkin, she's written several books on the mm. microbiome. She's a gastroenterologist, yeah. and she made this comment uh, a couple years ago when, when her and I talked that when she goes in to do a colonoscopy, she, the smell that she can get from the patient, she knows like that's kind of the signature of their microbiome. So mm. she can tell how sweet it is, how putrefied it is. That smell leads her to realize that uh, that person's gut is off or it's on target. And I, I realize like when my health is not totally on tracks, I've been traveling or yeah. working too much and all that, and I do a coffee enema, and then I go to defecate afterwards, that smell is key, that first smell. Mm. So I think that can be a barometer for some people to realize like, is do I have a healthy microbiome? Obviously you can test and, and all that. There's many tests yeah. now, thankfully, but this is just an anecdotal and easy self yeah. at home test to doesn't see. Doesn't cost anything. Doesn't yeah. cost anything and it can give you a, a nice insight. So when I'm healthy, having regular bowel movements, you yeah. know, at home, gardening, grounding, meditating, all doing all yeah. this stuff um, and not traveling, you know, that smell's not there. But when I come back, it, there's like, it's not like it smells terrible, but it's like a, a sweeter, more, it's mm. a distinct, kind of a dysbiotic type smell. Hmm. So I recommend that. And interestingly, the more meat I have, I, there's a, you the can smell that too. Hmm. So anyway, uh, it can I be- I think a, that has to do with maybe ability to produce enough stomach acid, which takes a lot of vagal activity. Totally and oftentimes could. Oftentimes we're eating on the go. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that as well. I noticed, you know, when we transitioned our daughter onto real foods mm -hmm. from breast milk, yeah. when we introduced meat, you know, changing diapers was a totally different uh, game, yeah. you know? Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you, you know, mm -hmm. like red meat or, or whatever, animal protein, yeah. once a day, you know, and yeah. you can get once the day, rest yeah. from yeah. nuts and seeds. And Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's good. And so you're doing coffee enemas regularly, and actually that was a big part of me overcoming irritable bowel, mm. or sorry, doing regular coffee enemas, nice. just really help flush things out. And of course, the coffee helps stimulate glutathione production in the liver, okay? Yeah. And so, but you want to make sure it's at room temperature, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't do a hot coffee enema. Yeah, not, not you'll learn the hard way. Yes, not. <laughs> definitely not. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so, you know, as we're, we're transitioning here into just your favorite foods, let's talk about some of your favorite ketogenic foods. Yeah, um, you know, I love curcumin. So we yeah. make ghee at home quite often, oh, like yeah. every other day. Yep. And uh, what I do is we have this juicer, so I juice uh, turmeric root uh -huh. in the juicer, and then as the ghee is cooled down, we put it in like a, a small mason jar, put, stir in the uh, coconut, or sorry, stir in the turmeric um, from the juice. And so it really creates this like super orangey, turmeric infused ghee. So I mm. think that's great. Uh, you know, because liquid fat, butter fat yeah. ghee can cause this endotoxemia. So to, to kind of neutralize that with uh, turmeric yeah. and to just have it kind of on demand, I think it's right. really right. key. Um, yeah. It got another food. We make a lot of dehydrated vegetable bread that's made of, it's basically a smoothie that's been dehydrated. So my yeah. wife has been a raw food you know, chef for a number of years. And um, so we, it's very low carb, diverse in a lot of different phytonutrients and, and fibrous compounds. So arugula, Swiss chard, we take a lot of our garden greens and put it in a food processor with soaked and sprouted nuts and seeds and uh, olive oil and put them in the dehydrator for eight to 10 hours. and. This stuff is so good it lasts like maybe five hours, you know, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we just love eating it. And yeah. we found it's the only way to, you know, have a five-year-old at home, not the only, but a, a reliable way to have her have a lot of vegetables in her diet. Yeah. Normally, you know, just slicing up, even if you put a lot of garlic, salt, and butter on broccoli, kids are not going to eat that. So, and then I bring them when I travel because I travel quite a bit and it's hard to reliably find vegetables on the road and keep this dietary diversity up, which is so healthy for our microbiome. So yeah, yeah the turmeric infused ghee butter and then the, the raw veggie breads are pretty. Now, are you taking like, are you putting the, the vegetables through a juicer and making a green juice and then taking the pulp? And making that? Um, no. Have you ever tried that? We haven't. That would be that would, that would be, be like phase two. Yeah. Yeah. So we take a food processor. Okay. And so the vegetables go in there. So there, it's it, you could drink it like a cold veggie yeah. soup, and then it's it's kind of um, kind of like you would make a pancake onto right. a dehydrator tray, okay. and then the the fats from the nuts and even the avocado, yep. a little yep. olive oil in there, keep it you know kind of stable. And then we do a little flaxseed, and it's dehydrated at 110 mm -hmm. degrees. So. Technically, it's, it's all raw. Raw, yeah. yeah. Yep. So easy to digest. Mm -hmm. 
pre-digested basically, yeah. good healthy fats, not animal-based fat, um, and totally diverse. I mean, you're getting like eight yeah. or nine different flavonoids, phytonutrients, different vegetables. Right. So love hits it, a lot man. of bases. Yeah. Love it, love it. So we talked about your veggie bread. Mm -hmm. We talked about your ghee. So taking grass-fed butter. Are you actually making the ghee or are you taking just your store, you know, store-bought grass-fed ghee? And we then, make our own. Okay, you Super, make your own, it just, yeah. It's just like one of these habits, like the breathing yes. exercises. Yeah. Throwing it on the on the stove top, you know, just at low and just yeah. getting used to hearing when it's clarified is okay. easy. Yep, yep. And then and then you're adding the turmeric in there, which is one of the best antioxidants you can put in your body, lo loaded with those curcuminoids, right. which is going to downregulate that LPS endotoxin formation in there. And it's a great carrier because really it's like, it's like a match made in heaven when you have phytonutrients and fats yeah. because they they synergize, they work well together. You actually absorb. Um, you absorb the phytonutrients better, the compounds better into your system, and then obviously they protect against the, the negative effect of, of totally. fats. Totally, so exactly. Good. Yeah, so that yep. curcumin's getting better absorbed, we yeah. feel. Haven't tested it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. So what's your, your what are the, uh, the your three, four, and five favorite foods on a ketogenic diet? Yeah, you know, I love eggs and avocado. Yeah. Uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, backyard chickens, mm -hmm. and so it's just, you know the the lutein and, and just how rich that yeah. egg and the choline and stuff like that i just love their eggs so um i'm a huge fan of that you know yeah. so for lunch even for dinner sometimes uh we you know three eggs and half an avocado right you know and in in making those eggs that's a great opportunity to sneak in healthy vegetables yeah. get in those phytonutrients rosemary tarragon yes you know I, we we grow a lot of basil tarragon rosemary and these polyphenols so that so we can good. just sneak them in as often as we can yeah so yeah i love that um we do a coconut uh, kind of dessert, which is mm -hmm. really great. So my wife um, has figured out a way to, you know, you just basically take your canned coconut, um, the milk, so the BPA-free coconut yep. milk, put it in the, mm -hmm. the fridge, take it out, and you can put that in an ice cream maker yep. with some cocoa nibs and chocolate. It's taste out I've of done this that world. Before. Yeah, it's so good. What we'll do is we'll actually take the coconut milk, we'll put it in the in the blender. Actually, it will, yeah, we'll take it, we'll put it in the blender, then we put it on parchment paper mm. in a pan, glass pan, right, on parchment paper yeah. that has coconut oil on the bottom to kind of keep that down. Put it in the freezer, then we pull it out, chop it up, stick it back in the blender, mm. right? And we've got stevia and vanilla extract and some different things like that in there. Mm. Blend it up and uh, it comes out and it's like literally got the consistency of ice cream. Nice, yeah. oh that sounds and amazing. And we put a little salt in there too. Yeah. Good carrier for the salt. It's great. So yeah, get that in our system. So yeah, so good. So um, so we talked about that. What uh, What's another really good food that you like? Yeah, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of, uh, well, you know, I do carb cycling as yeah. well. So yeah. that's, you know, one of the things that I love to, to throw in there on, you know, just the higher carb food mm -hmm. periodically. So yeah. I'll just take like purple sweet potatoes, Yeah. Um, you know, just, Put bake them on uh, coconut oil or sesame seed oil that can tolerate some of the higher fats, and uh, you know throw in garlic and onions and all that sort of stuff. So that can be like a way to cycle in healthy yes. fiber, healthy carbs. Yep. So I'll do that based upon you know how I feel yep. and and how my workouts are going or how intense my workout was. So right. the keto thing is is wonderful for a myriad mm -hmm. of different applications, but. If we're doing glycolytic work in the gym or, you know, sprinting, you know, yeah. we do, you know, uh, burn carbohydrates better in that context. So I will replenish a workout mm -hmm. with some of those foods. So that can be a staple once or twice a week. Yeah. But again, it's not just a, a plain old white russet potato. We're talking about purple and, yeah. you know, still getting them, focusing on this theme of polyphenols. Getting colors in our, yeah. in our diet. Yeah. So purple is rich in anthocyanins. Right? right? Like blueberries, red cabbage, different things like that. And so can you go through some of the different foods? Like I know there's orange that you can get into your diet. There's white. What are some of the compounds we find in the different colors? Yeah. So I, you know, I like purples and blues and reds. Yeah. So that's what I focus on. You know, some of the oranges like mm -hmm. orange bell pepper can be yeah. great. Uh, but you want to make sure you get organic bell pepper. They do yes. spray the heck out of those peppers. Yeah. I've tried to grow them and, and I understand why they spray them because they just bugs love them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's key. Yeah. You know, but it, but it turns out that these different colors, and I like to f get people to focus on bitter vegetables. Yeah. Um, and so the diverse array of colors is amazing, but the more bitter it has, mm. uh, the more bitter constituents, the more it will turn on our gut hormones and activate mm. this parasympathetic right. tone. Because bitter is good for your liver. That's what I always tell yeah. people. Yeah. So easy endive, acronym to remember. Bitter, good liver. for the liver. Totally. Yep. Key, yeah. So endive, radicchio, those mm -hmm. are like key frise. Those are like key three 
a lot of people are familiar with like spinach salads, you know, yeah. or romaine lettuce, like mm -hmm. graduate beyond that, you know, yeah. so endive, frisee, radicchio, things we always have around. We'll throw in mustard greens, yeah. ruby streaks are another great kind of mustardy, you know, bitter green. Mm -hmm. And that can be just, you know, we talk about dietary diversity, microbiome yeah. stability, reducing endotoxemia, getting these flavonoids, so, and good fiber, you know. Yeah. Great for motility and having that bowel movement. So that's why I encourage people, you know, it, it's great that people are shopping at Walmart and trying to get these healthy foods, but, but supporting, you know, supporting your local community, local farms, yeah. you know, either growing it your own or making sure that you're finding a, a farmer where you live that can help supply these. And yeah. then you're eating seasonally too. Right. Which is key. Yeah, absolutely. And so how about, you know, just some dietary staples like broccoli, cauliflower, different things like that. How do you like to prepare those? Yeah, so we like to make uh, cauli rice a lot. Yeah. So that's yeah. super easy to do. Yeah. Uh, and then if we take, you know, other things like zucchini, like noodles, yeah. so spiralize that. It's right. fun to get the kids make involved. Pasta. And How about pesto? You like pesto? Yeah, we do that all yeah. the time and, yeah. and make like a, you know, like a pumpkin seed type pesto yeah. dressing for our salad. So instead of balsamic vinegar and olive oil, mm -hmm. okay, it can taste amazing, but yeah. you know, every Every single day that can get boring. So yeah, doing pesto with you know cilantro and garlic and pine nuts. I mean, I think that's it's an amazing way to just spice up your vegetables, and then you're getting in these detoxifying phytonutrients as well. Yeah, absolutely. How about like a mashed potatoes alternative out of cauliflower? Do you like that? We do like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just. Um, Again, I, I've grown cauliflower. It, it attracts a lot of bugs. Does it really? So that's yeah. another one. You've got to make sure that it's organic. Yeah. And, and sometimes I just kind of wonder how all these cauliflower look so perfect and uniform. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know about <laughs> that. You know. So anyway, I, I think it can be amazing uh, in terms of yeah. like transitions because people are used yeah. to potatoes yeah. and rice and right. cauli rice. You know, it's rich in glucoraphanin yeah. and all that. So. Yeah. And what we like to do with it is we'll take, we'll make no mash, we call it no mashed potatoes. So it's cauliflower mashed potatoes. We put a whole bunch of grass fed butter or ghee or something like that in there, a lot of turmeric in it and kind of make it more orange and then a lot of different herbs. Nice. So rosemary, basil, different things like that. And you can just get that great flavor to it. Oh, it sounds so, amazing. You're yeah, my little hungry. twin boys, I mean, yeah. they're here they are. You know, 22 months old, and they're just loving it, asking mm. for more and more and more. So, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's it works so good, good for the kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, we've had an awesome interview here, yeah. you know, talking about the microbiome and different nutrition strategies that we can apply with this. And so, Mike, is there anything left that you want to just address the um, listeners with when it comes to applying a ketogenic diet and also improving the microbiome at the same time? Yeah, you know, one thing that we didn't yet address, I think it's important yeah. to, to kind of talk about, you know, there is kind of a stigma in the microbiome community when it comes to ketosis. And so some yeah. people say, and they don't add any context or color to this, but they'll say, you know, ketogenic diet's not good for the microbiome. And what I want to just leave people just, you know, with this final thought is that if we think of a healthy microbiome, we're making a lot of butyric acid. It's yes. a short chain fatty acid that's fermented from fiber. It's unanimously known to be healthy. Uh, it affects DNA signaling, DNA stability, mm -hmm. inflammatory pathways. Well, it turns out that beta hydroxybutyrate and butyric acid uh, cross-convert and are, are very structurally similar. Really? So the uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate is the base of butyric acid. So you remove one hydrogen from, yeah. from butyric acid and you get BHB. So that's maybe partly, but you know, so, so if someone doesn't do all the, you know, hundreds of grams of fiber per day because they're in, on a ketogenic style diet, um, they are still having high levels of the signaling molecule called beta-hydroxybutyrate. That's the main ketone made yeah. by the liver. So that's what I would love for people to just sink on is that a ketogenic diet is very uh, fitting and, and kind of, cr there's a lot of crossover with a healthy a harmony. Yeah. microbiome. So that's, you know, just remember that sound bite. If, if someone says, oh yeah, I heard the keto diet's bad for your microbiome, is let them know, you know, this metabolite, this ketone made by our liver is very structurally similar. Yeah to this, this secondary short chain fatty acid. Exactly, well, that's, that's very fascinating. And I mean, really just the principles that we talked about. So you can definitely get a lot of fiber. Avocados have tons of fiber exactly. in them. If you're doing pumpkin seeds or some sort of ground or, or uh, sprouted seeds, nuts have a lot of fiber in them. Um, vegetables, just doing a lot of um, non-starchy vegetables, obviously good on the ketogenic diet. They're gonna help you, they're gonna help keep blood sugar under control and they're loaded with fiber which then your gut microbiome breaks down into butyric acid, 
which again is structurally similar to beta hydroxybutyrate, which is your main ketone that your, your body runs off of. So there you go. You know, yeah. Just really good stuff. And Mike, I just want to acknowledge you for being really a leading expert in the ketogenic diet and the microbiome and kind of bringing this, these two worlds together. Mm -hmm. You know, you're well respected in both fields and just bringing them together and, and, um, and really just being a great representative of it yourself. I know you grow your own food, you guys live the lifestyle. And so, um, so you're not just saying this because it's good theory, but you're actually applying it and living the lifestyle itself. And uh, you're, so you're a great role model and example of that. Thank you, it means yeah. a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And so if you've enjoyed this inter, oh, and, and you know what, before we do that, yeah. Mike, where can our people uh, find out more about you? Where can they get, you know, belly fat effect here, you've got high intensity health, you're mm -hmm. on YouTube, you're on your podcast, where can they find out more, more about you? Yeah, uh, highintensityhealth.com uh, is the main website, and then in YouTube as well, High Intensity yes. Health, or Mike Mutzel will pull it up, but that's yep. the main, mm -hmm. I do have other websites and landing pages, but that's mm -hmm. like the main one if people wanna connect. And I get a lot of emails and, and stuff like that, I'm happy to write back and help people yeah. out any way I can. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And so if you've enjoyed this interview and many of the other interviews you've, you've seen in the Keto Edge Summit, then we just wanna really encourage you to consider owning this for yourself. If you own it, then you're gonna be able to have access to all the interviews, the transcripts, um, really all the bonuses that we have, all the different strategies to really help yourself live the ketogenic lifestyle and get all of those benefits. And so if you would do that, if you would consider owning it, we would be honored and privileged. And we will see you on a future interview.